Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. We're so glad that you came, and we're so excited to have this conversation today, especially in light of the recent release of the American Jobs Plan from the Biden-Harris administration. It's a really exciting moment for progressive climate and economic policy. Um, and there's so much wonderful content and framing in the American Jobs Plan, but still many questions remain, like what's the appropriate scale of investment? How do we make sure that funding reaches the communities that need it most and that they have a say in where it goes? How do we ignite private investments um, through public investment without sacrificing progressive values. Um, and luckily, we have some of the best people I can think of to talk about this stuff today. Um, so we have Brandon Hurlbut, we have Lenore Palladino, and we have John Washington, all joining us as speakers today. Um, so I'm going to walk you through their bios, um, per usual. Um, and just, I know all of them personally, and it's really just a real treat to get to talk to them all today. Um, so Brandon Hurlbut uh, is a leader on climate policy, finance, technology, advocacy, law, politics, and the media. And I can attest that he is actually a leader on all of those. <laughs> he served uh, in the Obama administration as US Department of Energy Chief of Staff and in the White House as the President's Liaison to the Energy and Environment Cabinet Agencies. Brandon provided leadership and counsel to the White House and Cabinet Secretaries during high-profile initiatives and challenges, including the deployment of $90 billion in clean energy investments under the Obama Recovery Act, which we'll talk a lot about today, the Fukushima nuclear accident in Japan, the Gulf oil spill, and Hurricane Sandy. He also served on the Investment Committee for DOE's $38 billion Clean Energy Fund. After work in public service, Brandon co-founded Boundary Stone Partners, a government affairs firm, and is a senior advisor to NGP Energy Technology Partners, the third. <laughs> and funny enough, when I first came into climate policy, Brandon was one of the first people I met and taught me a lot of the things that really kept me afloat for that first year. So thank you again, Brandon. <laughs> so we also have Lenore Palladino who's the assistant professor in the School of Public Policy and the Department of Economics and a research associate at UMass Amherst uh, in the Political Economy Research Institute, as well as a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. Palladino's research centers on corporate power, stakeholder corporations, shareholder primacy, and the relationship between corporate governance and the labor market. She's also started a really exciting new body of work on care and climate that will hear about today. Um, she's also written on financial transaction taxes, employee ownership, and the rise of fintech. She's published in Politics and Society, the International Review of Applied Economics, the Yale Journal of Regulation, and the Fordham Journal of Corporate and Financial Law, as well as the Financial Times and State Tax Notes. That sounds incredibly exciting, state tax notes. You have to tell me more about that, Lenore. Uh, she frequently works with policymakers, media, and advocates on corporate and financial policy. And I can also attest that Lenore is the best to talk to fi about financial policy with. She's taught me a lot. Um, and now we also have, last but definitely not least, John Washington. He's an organizer on the Homes Guarantee Campaign at People's Action. John got his start in organizing in the Occupy movement and was an organizer and organizing director with Push Buffalo before moving on to national work. So we'll be talking a lot about his work at Push Buffalo today. He has also worked on powerful campaigns on housing justice, climate justice, criminal justice, and economic justice. John has been part of the leading climate and housing justice legislation in the nation. He focuses on building the capacity and understanding of members and leaders to participate fully and making real change and is one of my favorite experts on actually policy implementation in local communities and at the local level. So really excited to have him here today to talk. And currently he's building a national campaign to guarantee safe quality and green social housing to end homelessness. So thanks all of you for being here today. 
Um, and just so you all know, our audience, to submit a question to our panel, you just need to click on the Q&A button that appears on the bottom of your screen when you hover over the webinar window with your cursor. We'll be taking questions in about the last 25, 20 minutes um, of the hour. So be sure to drop those in as we go so that we can address them later on in the conversation. Um, so we're going to go straight to our panelists and the way this is going to work, which might be a little bit different than other panels, is we're going to talk for a few minutes with each panelist and then we'll go, we'll open it up to some questions that all the panelists will answer um, together. So we'll start with Lenore as our resident economist here. Lenore, can you tell us how much impact do recovery packages have on our economy? There's always a lot of talk whenever recovery packages get introduced, um, even before you know they're hitting the congressional floor for debate and they seem to be like real inflection points um, in our economic thinking and economic policy. So how much impact do they really have on our economy and are the effects lasting? Um, great, well, thanks so much for having me. And I think being here with the whole panel and especially with you, Rihanna, um, you know, you can't talk about innovation in policymaking without looking to Rihanna as a clear leader for all of us. So I'm, I'm so um, glad to be here with you. Um, so, to, you know, I'll try to answer that question really briefly and using as uh, few word, few economics words as possible, which is <laughs> <laughs> my goal as an economist. So we're facing once in a generation challenges. I don't need to spell that out for this group. I think we know that major public spending is critical to economic recovery and economic resilience from, from theory, from history, and in terms of equity. So in terms of macroeconomic theory, though there is a lot of variation and a lot of theories that we could talk about in the Q&A, we know that government spending is necessary when consumption and investment fall. From history, recent history and uh, longer ago, we know that if we don't invest enough as, a, as the public, it takes us longer to recover and the majority of us don't experience the recovery as quickly as the wealthiest um, segment of our population. And finally, we know that we live in an economy with deep structural racism, deep structural sexism, many other forms of um, intersectional oppression. And we know that unless we pay attention to how recovery programs actually roll out, they'll be inequitable. That's just baked in. So let me see a couple other things about each of those points briefly. Um, in terms of theory, you know, just to first, I want to back up and clarify at least my framework, and I think shared by a lot of folks at, at Roosevelt and elsewhere, are um, the sort of mainstream way of thinking about macroeconomic policy is basically wrong. It's not that we need the government to just step in when there's some kind of market imperfection, right? This is what I see in sort of the, the textbooks that I, I look through to use with my students. The government is always structuring private economic activity, not just in particular times of downturn. And the choices of how those structures are set up matter in terms of who they benefit. Government fiscal policy or spending policy is just one component of how governments structure private economic activity. So we're talking here about recovery and resilience, but we need to pay attention to that structuring all the time. Second point is just to give a few facts um, about our history. The Great Depression long ago gives us plenty of data points, but our more recent history, the Great, the great Financial Crisis and the Great Recession, were an important example of the economic and political impacts that economic stagnation can have. So 3 million people dropped out of the workforce between 2008 and, and 2012. Uh, certainly be great to hear from John and, and to talk more later about obviously the major implications in the housing sector. Um, but a real lesson of the Great Recession in that Obama era approach was that a collapse in spending, if not met by an immediate and intensive government response can have long term effects. So jobs didn't reach the pre um, uh, recessionary levels until 2015 or 16, even though the stock market recovered uh, by 2011. Wages didn't really recover until 2020. And then we know, of course, what happened after that. The fight during that last era was about debts and deficits. And that really framed the conversation about what we could do in a really misguided way. And I think that uneven recovery uh, geographically 
also plays an important role in understanding the fractured politics that we've had uh, for the last decade. So just to fast forward for to today, we know that in the second quarter of 2020, our GDP, meaning our overall economic activity, was about 10 points below what we call, here I will use a little jargon, our potential output, meaning what we actually have the real capacity to produce in the economy. This was the largest gap on record, right? It was insane. We also know that climate change is already wreaking economic habit, havoc, and if we don't do something about it, we're going to see economic crises like we have never experienced before. So we know that without major public investment to, to really restructure our economy, the economic pain that we'll feel will be much longer and be felt much more inequitably. So finally, I'll just say again, our, our economic recovery has to be proactively aimed at equity. Um, you know, Janelle Jones, who's the chief economist at the Department of Labor, uh, which I never get tired of saying, um, uh, uh, produce, you know, developed a framework that probably many folks listening have heard about, the Black Women Best Framework, which I'll just quote from her, uh, I'll quote her, is an economic principle that argues if Black women who, since our nation's founding, have been among the most excluded and exploited by the rules that structure our society, can one day thrive in the economy, then it must finally be working for everyone. So long story short, I think there's really important um, language and development in the Green New Deal resolution, which Rihanna could certainly tell us much more about, that also frames how recovery and resilience investment needs to be actively structured uh, towards equity in order to not reproduce the structures of inequality that we have. So recovery packages make a major difference, and it's not just about the one-time uh, investment, it's about the investments for the long-term and the types of economic activity that those uh, packages um, uh, support and the type that they don't support. So I will have a chance hopefully to talk later about some of the particular uh, uh, sectors of the economy that I hope will be supported in, in recovery packages in 2021. Yeah, definitely. And just a quick question. So if an inadequate recovery can sort of lead to output deficits for, you know, a decade or more, can an adequate or even like a robust recovery package spark, um, I want to say an economic boom or sort of a hot economy? Yeah, I think that it's a it's really um, important to think about both the magnitude and then also how uh, it's structured, both in terms of the equity questions I was talking mm -hmm. about, but also in terms of whether or not the majority of people who produce the economic value actually benefit from the economic value. So if you put a ton of money into the economy, but 99% of it is captured by, say, the top 1%, just to coin a phrase, um, of, of households, then you're not going to see an economic boom. You're going to see the same stagnation and disconnect that we see today, maybe not to the depth of the pandemic, but you're going to see that long lasting. So it's really about the structures that we have to make sure that value is, is uh, equitably shared. That makes sense. And so one of the key tenets of the Green New Deal is that climate change is a result of economic activity. And so decarbonizing, um, fully decarbonizing and definitely rapidly decarbonizing requires us to transform our economy. And so going with that premise, if decarbonizing our economy requires us to transform our economy, how can recovery packages help drive that transformation forward? Yeah, there's so many ways, but I'll talk maybe just about one and we can talk more in the Q&A. Yeah. So, you know, we are seeing um, a real, I think, reckoning in the pandemic with the reality that our uh, care infrastructure, meaning our sort of paid support for care, child care, residential care, home health care, uh, K through 12 care, um, really is very patchwork and, and almost broken, you could say, in many cases. But we know that unless we have opportunities for people to um, benefit from care, they won't be able to equitably participate in the recovery of the economy generally. There was a great quote from Katie Porter that I think she wrote uh, just last night, just like roads, a care infrastructure is necessary to get to work. Or I think she said a childcare. Childcare is necessary to get to work, but I'm broadening it a little bit. 
Um, and I think that really is, you know, something that uh, you and I, Rihanna, have been thinking a lot about. We have a I'll just plug a paper coming out soon <laughs> on this topic, um, but I'll just say a couple of the reasons, you know, one is, as I sort of started to mention before, if we think about the transformation of the economy and the creation of a clean energy sector, those jobs will continue to be pale and male, just like the fossil fuel industry unless we have a care infrastructure that actually supports uh, people being able to have access to those uh, clean energy sector jobs. A second point is that care jobs themselves are clean energy jobs, and we have a ton of work to do to respect uh, the care workforce, uh, pay family supporting wages, um, pay benefits, and also change the, the culture that says that this is women's work, right? Men can do care work too. That's necessary in the home, and it's necessary in the paid care workforce. So I think it's an exciting moment where um, we're certainly seeing the threads come together of building the care infrastructure with the Green New Deal, and there's a lot more to do to continue to make that case. Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought up care because there's been a lot of discussion about the ways that the plan proposes to invest in clean energy and things that we sort of typically think of as green. But like you mentioned, transforming an economy requires us to think across the economy and what structures um, what structures underlie our economy and allow people to participate. And so those care investments, even though people might think of them as separate, are actually also incredibly crucial to decarbonization. So thank you, Lenore. <laughs> we'll move to Brandon. Um, so Brandon mentioned in your bio that you actually helped design a lot of the clean energy investments in Aura. Um, I'm so glad I finally get to say that on a webinar. I'm always like telling people that. I'm like, don't worry, I understand how this works. I know Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but how does the uh, American Jobs Plan compare to those investments in ARA? And in what ways do the climate investments in the American Jobs Plan need to go farther or be designed differently than the ones in ARA? Because we're at a different moment, right? In ARA, you were talking about sort of keeping the solar and the wind industry going, building them up. And now we're at a moment where I think people are thinking a lot more about deployment, right? Um, and those industries are a bit more mature than they were back in 08. Um, so yeah, just tell us a little bit about that. Well, thanks so much, Rihanna, for having me. This is such a great panel. I'm so excited for the discussion and just so fortunate to you know work with you. Um, the American Jobs Plan is really an opening bid. There are so many details that need to be worked out in the plan uh, by the Congress, uh, but there are a lot of similarities uh, to what we did with the Obama Recovery Act. First of all, there's a political reality that's incorporated, I think, into this plan, uh, much like we had to do uh, with the Obama Recovery Act. So we had, uh, you know, 59 to 60 Democrats in the Senate uh, for the Obama Recovery Act. If you remember, Al Franken had oh, took a long time to get seated, and then Ted Kennedy got sick. So we were dealing with a 60 vote threshold, but we didn't always have 60 Democratic senators that were present to vote. So we couldn't lose any Democratic votes. Uh, Mitch McConnell had said the day after Obama was elected, uh, his job was to make Obama a one-term president. So. We, so that was the position of the Republicans. So we had to keep every Democratic vote uh, in the Senate, and there were a lot more moderates in the Senate at that time. So a lot more sort of like Joe Manchin types. Uh, we had, you know, Lieberman, uh, Ben Nelson, uh, and, and several others like that. So it, similarly, this is what the Biden-Harris administration is dealing with. We have a very narrow majority in both the House and the Senate. So in the Senate, you know, there's 50 Democrats. Um, and so, you know, they can't lose any of those Democrats and they're not optimistic about getting Republican support. So they had to craft this with that in mind where you could go through the, use the reconciliation tool uh, to pass it. And the reconciliation tool really limits what you can do on policy design. Uh, so that is part of the constraints that they're dealing with, with this. 
Some of the similarities on the policy design though are they're, they're using grants and tax credits, procurement and financing as the tools in this several trillion dollar package. Um, there are pros and cons to all of those different tools that as we learned on, under the Obama Recovery Act, uh, there are certain pros and cons with things like tax credits. Um, you know, the idea with those is that you're supposed to be able to move faster. Uh, grants can take longer to work through, um, you know, the, the bureaucracy, especially, you know, block grants to states. Mm -hmm. You have to move it through, through those bureaucracies as well. Uh, the good news about the uh, American Jobs Plan is the scale is much larger than what we did with the Recovery Act. Uh, so under the Recovery Act for the, the sort of clean energy and climate provisions, we had $90 billion uh, of investments. Um, you know, which we, which we you had a lot of success with. I mean, those led to dramatic declines in solar and wind and batteries, EVs, LED lights. And so what Biden and Harris are, you know, um, proposing is at a much larger scale than that 90 billion. They're talking about, you know, at least seven, you know, somewhere around the lines of 700 billion in just in clean energy investments, maybe more. As you mentioned, Rian, the good news with this it also is that it's very focused on deployment. With the Recovery Act, about two thirds of those investments were very short term stimulus into things like unemployment benefits. The, the clean energy provisions were viewed as sort of more longer term investments. And there was a lot of that money was dedicated to R&D for things like ARPA-E and Sunshot and programs like that. One of the more successful parts of the Recovery Act um, investments uh, into clean energy was, was, it's called the 1603 program. And what that did is it took the existing tax credit for wind and solar and made it a cash grant uh, instead of, you know, the, the, using the tax credit. The tax credit can be clunky because solar and wind developers have to be able to monetize the tax credit and they really don't have the balance sheet to sort of do that. So you have to bring in a third party, what's called a tax equity investor. And that just creates more traction and brain damage uh, to, the, to, the, to the actual transaction. So what we did on the Recovery Act is we made through the 1603 program, we made a direct pay cash grant in lieu of the tax credit. Biden and Harris are proposing the same thing. And they're saying we would do this over 10 years. They would take the existing you know, tax credits for solar and wind and extend them by 10 years and make it direct pay. So th those were enormously successful in our plan under the Recovery Act, and it's good to see that they're proposing it here. Other good news with the um, American Jobs Plan is, is equity is a central tenant with the Justice 40 standard. We didn't have anything like that in the Recovery Act. Uh, so this is a, a sign that all of the advocacy that you know people have been doing over the last several years uh, is working, it's being heard. And so this is very encouraging. Some of the open questions, uh, Rihanna, are things like this clean energy standard um, that they're, you know, proposing. It's going to, you know, come down to a parliamentarian as to whether those things can make it through in reconciliation uh, or not. Uh, there is some language about streamlining permitting, uh, but it's pretty vague, and those are things that can really trip up and slow down deployments. Um, and so there's, those are what we call some of these soft costs, getting projects interconnected, getting through different studies and whatnot. Uh, those are the things that, you know, uh, would need to, we need to move faster. And I don't know if this bill will accomplish that, uh, but they're at least signaling that they're going to try to do that. That's awesome. Thank you for all of that. I want to turn to John really quickly because I uh, have some complicated feelings about tax credits and I know John does too. Um, so John, I wanted to open up the question to you about, um, particularly when you think about implementation, um, what are you thinking about tax credits and the ways that that can sort of shape um, how these things are enacted? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, Brandon already said it, like, like you can't use a tax credit in, in, in many, like, I can't go to the bank, right, with tax credits and say, hey, give me X dollars, so much negotiation, there's so much even thought process. And then also in reality, when we talk about the corporate tax rate, we are creating a loopholes, we're creating ways for companies um, to leverage our people against us. And so my big beef with tax credits is that, there is this frame that that kind of names it as like these are that that corporations are doing us a favor when they're receiving an enormous benefit uh, from these tax credits and the ability not to pay taxes that otherwise they may not have been able to loophole and that's part of like this new art of okay we've loopholed all these other taxes now we're going to get some other ones because we know that we can get tax credits for those and we look great we, we invested in these things and most people don't see the monetization the alphabet soup that these tax credits have to go to and to me, all of that undermines the control and democratic decision making of a community. If a tax credit is associated with a zip code, that community has no idea that happened. They see the results, but there's almost no way to engage them in the clunky process because it's not just slow, it moves fast and slow. Some parts of it move very slow, and then some parts of move, move incredibly fast. And as an on the ground organizer, it's almost impossible to get an entire community to, to go through a decision making process and understand the exact leverage that that tax credit offers the community so that they can get the benefits that they deserve based on the dollar value that we're offering back to corporations. Totally makes sense. Um, so I want to go quickly to you, Brandon, about private investment. So one of the things that people talk a lot about um, when it comes to the R clean energy investments was that um, the government invested 90 billion, but it spurred private investment two to three times that amount. And so thinking about the American Jobs Plan and just recovery funding overall, how can we again encourage private investments while strengthening labor and equity standards? Such a great question, Rihanna. You know, we need to encourage private investment because the private sector has just so much more capital. Uh, the US government will not be able to finance a global decarbonization of the entire global economy on its own. We, we, we need to be able to leverage the you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars uh, of capital in the private sector to, to make this go faster and meet the, the goals that the scientists are telling us that we, we need to meet. We had success with this in, in the Recovery Act. We were able to sort of launch entire industries um, and this has historically been a great role for government, going all the way back to gov early government investments in railroads, seeded you know, that entire industry, or semiconductors. You know, the U.S. government played a large role in seeding that industry and then you know, having, you know, creating a, a competitive edge for America to have those jobs here. What we did in the Recovery Act with, uh, like I was very involved with the Department of Energy Loan Guarantee Program. And so before uh, the Recovery Act, there were no what they call utility scale solar projects in the United States. That, that utility scale means like a large you know, solar project, like 100 megawatts. Um, so when you think about out in the desert, these you know, massive solar farms, those did not exist before the Obama Recovery Act because you know, banks, do, they never want to do the first project. It's too risky. Uh, they will only lend when something is proven. So what we did is we were the lender on those projects to prove that the technology works. And after we did, you know, six of those projects and lent the money, which the taxpayers got repaid uh, on those loans, um, the private sector banks saw that, okay, this works. And then now, you know, there is gigawatts upon gigawatts of solar and wind being deployed every year now that is being you know, financed by uh, the private sector. And those are moving fast. I can tell you that you know, as an investor, going to these solar and wind developers, um, you know, they have lots of opportunities for capital right now. And that is a, that is a good thing. Um, what the Biden-Harris plan is proposing um, is, is a clean energy and sustainability accelerator. And they've talked about $27 billion in that to mobilize you know, private investment um, into many different parts of the you know, uh, economy. 
So there's not a lot of detail there yet, but that could be something like a green bank, or you could seed local uh, green banks or local accelerators with that money, uh, which could be um, attractive. Um, but as you mentioned, Rihanna, we have to think about labor and equity uh, as you're making those investments. And so uh, what the government can do in those situations is condition you know, those investments upon meeting certain standards. Um, you know, paying a fair wage, opportunity to, you know, unionize, making sure that we're directing those investments first to the communities that have suffered, you know, most, uh, you know, from, you know, pollution and fossil fuels uh, and these other, you know, uh, you know, destructive forces. So, so I think, you know, that is what the Biden-Harris, you know, folks have in mind, um, you know, with, with making those investments. So that is, that is, that makes a lot of sense. And I wanted to turn to Lenore really quickly um, and quickly because I want to preserve time for Don uh, to talk about the National Investment Authority because some people have, um, I mean, and we've written about it at Roosevelt, have suggested uh, one way to do that is by actually creating a National Investment Authority or some public investment arm um, that can direct capital in certain ways. So Lenore, do you wanna chime in on that? Quickly? Yeah, just really briefly. I mean, I, I agree with Brandon that I think that the, uh, the private capital plays a really important role in structuring and creating new economic activity and opportunities. Um, you know, I think government plays a foundational role. And if anybody who's watching hasn't read uh, Mariana Mazzucato's new book, um, it's, it's really worth reading uh, in all your free time. The basic idea, um, though, is where do the benefits of that capital go? Do they go just to the uh, wealthy white households who own the you know vast majority of corporate equity or corporate stock? Do we allow uh, corporations who are getting all this capital to then conduct, say, for example, trillions of dollars of stock buybacks that enrich their CEOs while they uh, hold down worker wages? So the National Investment Authority is a um, really innovative proposal from law professor Sally Omarova. And, we're writing about it. We'll have a paper out on it um, hopefully soon as well. But the question is when investment is coming from household capital in the form of our retirement savings, pensions, those IRAs, uh, you know, 401ks that, that many of us have, how do we structure the investment process, which is incredibly complicated right now, so that the households actually get the benefit of the capital that they are uh, allowing to be used in the investment process. We could talk more about that in detail, but I see this as one of the key components of um, equity in, in the investment process. Awesome, thank you, Lenore. So we're gonna turn to John now um, to talk more about um, policy design. John um, is honestly one of the smartest people I know on policy design, particularly when you're thinking about how it impacts state and local communities and how to um, ensure or encourage or really just make a way for democratic control um, of public investment. And so, John, I know we talk a lot about the importance of policy design, um, particularly when it comes to serving communities. So in your opinion, what is the difference between a poorly designed recovery package and a well-designed recovery package? Well, it's, it's leverage and control. And I think that um, in many ways, we have to stop thinking about communities. <laughs> <laughs> as recipients and services and really think of them as partners and in the equity frame, right, of actual partners who deserve um, not just the stake, but the benefits as, as Lenore just, just alluded to. And I think the reality is policies are designed to pass. They're designed to work through the complexities of the number of senators and all of those things. And then we really need to get like a, a refresher in our course in government. They're not designed to be executed. They're not designed to be adjudicated. Uh, they're not designed to work with the enormous differences between a community and the nonprofits and businesses um, that are designed to receive these vehicles, right? So perfect example is if, if there's a tax credit to do affordable housing um, that has been assigned to my community because it's poor, um, how, how do I know what that tax credit is, 
who actually is financially capable of taking advantage of it and how to communicate with them about what my needs are and how to relate to them around those needs. And the irony is the more you actually relate to those people around your needs, the less able you are to access those, those things. Like if I'm buddy buddy with, with a local affordable housing developer, I'm not gonna be on the list to get that house. And so we've created this complex world of, of mathematics that really avoid the reality that every single complexity was designed to take power, money and resources away from people and communities and lift them up um, to, to this, this corporate world that, that has this capital, uh, partly because the government has given it to them. Even though the government did the work of seeding these ideas and building these structures, it then says, okay, now you own it. So even though you know the government built the railroads, now we have CSX and we have billionaires who manage those railroads uh, based on entirely on their interests and with no, no real concern for community. And then they're gonna get a tax credit because they decided to um, you know, finance some affordable housing in a neighborhood that they've never been connected to and that ultimately the people who are in charge of managing the project don't have time to connect to because they have to figure out how to monetize tax credits. So I, I think the design has to build into it a way to organize people. Businesses are organized, governments are organized. We have to organize people and figure out how we give them actual leverage to be able to say no, right? Like, like there are communities that don't want these tax credit projects and yet they can't say no, they can't pull the plug, they can't pull their equity and move to another partner, they can't negotiate like the business world does. And so I think that's what's so important about policy design is actually thinking about yourself as the person in that neighborhood, what does it mean to you, how do you leverage all of these big ideas and big words that we're talking about. Totally. And so going off of that there's been a lot of talk like. Brandon mentioned it about the Biden administration's commitment to have 40% of the benefits of investment, let's remember it's the benefits of investment, go to frontline communities, and that's including the American Jobs Plan. And how does the recovery package need to be designed so that communities actually not only receive these benefits, but or these investments, but like you said, benefit from them and control how they are directed? Well, I think one thing is that policymakers need to actually start to play through what these things look like in the circulatory system of money and resources that happen in every community, especially based on, on federal funding. Uh, and I'll give a perfect example. If we want to weatherize a million homes, we're going to raise the home value of a million homes and we're going to attract capital investors. And we're also going to raise the, the property taxes of those homes. And so for me, I personally think that there need to be, that's, that's not necessarily a benefit. And so many of our benefits are based on exchange. So if your house is worth more money, that's that's actually not a good thing if you don't want to move. Like if you never want to move and leave it to your kids, your house being worth more money means that you pay higher taxes. That is not a necessary benefit. And so I think redefining what benefits look like and letting communities define what benefits look like and have power over the implementation of these programs, which I think is very possible because most of them are large grants. They're grants to states, they're grants to institutions that have previously received them. And I think another thing I wanna name about these grants is if I run a small local nonprofit that's got a staff of 20 people and now I'm offered like it happened in, in 08, um, you know, a million dollars to buy land that, that was vacated by banks, that, that might, you know, multiply my budget by 20 times. It might entirely change the framework that, that, that my organization was trying to figure out how to do this work in. And so I think we really need a lot more local infrastructure and we need the power and resources to be able to build this local infrastructure to work through the problems because the bill needs to pass as it passes because of the politics, but we also need to make sure that as it, as it that it doesn't trickle down, that it actually flows down to communities and flows through communities and then back up. And we really need to challenge that, that idea that, that starting the trickle is just enough. We actually have to figure out how to pool those resources and be able to, to, to build off of them over time. And that's why I don't like the frame of recovery because it assumes that we wanna recover back to where we were at. And I don't, 
I don't want to go back to where we're at. I want to go to a very fundamentally different place. And I think that if we can change um, the power dynamics of these, even as simple as things as if you get a tax credit, then the community gets a stake in the company, right? Um, every tax credit deal creates new entities. There are all kinds of ways that that corporations use to, to leverage buyouts and to create this kind of powerful accountability of equity with a, with a little lead. Um, and I think that we can start to get creative about doing more of those, especially as we try to follow through on this 40% investment um, thing, because it's very vague, right? And it's, and it's not easy to say, okay, what does that 40% mean? For every billion dollars, how much do I get? How much does this person get? Right. So I think we really need to go bigger as far as the scale to the level of the Thrive Agenda, and then go smaller into the weeds of what does it look like? Can, I can't hear you, sorry. Zoom life. Well, I, I can just say real quick that I think it's it's key that the most effective, effective communities um, have training programs and work invested in them that allow them to be able to negotiate with someone um, like Brandon, uh, who, who has a vast amount of knowledge. But if you walk down my street, I doubt anybody would really fully understand how to leverage that. And I think much more time needs to be invested in thinking through these processes outside of a political season and more in a time when, when we can start to build a basis for how recovery can lead to a point where we, we don't need to recover anymore because we're not making the same mistakes and setting up the same conditions. Totally. Sorry thinking, about that. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, it's so interesting what John is saying because I've been like thinking about this. And, you know, if I were in their shoes, what would I do differently, especially after what we've learned, you know, from prior, you know, examples like the Obama Recovery Act? And on the grants, you know, one thing I am worried about is. I saw firsthand when you put a bunch of money, you know, on a bureaucracy that like is not totally equipped to handle it. So at the Department of Energy, the weatherization program you mentioned, John, you know, there was small staff there. They dealt primarily, you know, a couple hundred million dollar budget with like, you know, weatherizing homes in the Northeast. And then in the Recovery Act, they got billions of dollars, which was great. But like executing on how to move that money you know, uh, was a big challenge. And now after Trump, I, the, the Biden Harris people are walking into, you know, a federal government that has been hollowed out in many circumstances, right? I mean, they did really destruction to the civil service there. Uh, and so they have a big challenge of having to rebuild that and be able to move that money um, in an effective way. And I'm so curious, like what you think about how they could do that. I've also been thinking about procurement, right? And, and, you know, Rihanna, you've written so eloquently about, you know, World War II mobilization. I am a strong believer uh, in the Green New Deal and, and mobilizing like we did in, in, in the World War II uh, for climate. And, and the government there used vast procurement powers to quickly build an arsenal of democracy. Um, and I wonder today, can we do those same things, right? Can, can procurement, which I've seen can move very slow, can we mobilize it quickly enough to meet these goals? And I think we saw an operation warp speed, you know, when the government has an emergency, it can, you know, move. People are saying, we're not gonna have a vaccine for several years, it's gonna take a while to deploy it. Well, that's, when the government declares this emergency, it can, it can move quickly. And so I'm wondering, can we use those procurement powers for climate in the way that we have for Operation Warp Speed and the way we did it for World War II? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we're going to move here to audience questions. So hopefully someone please ask a question about procurement. Um, but talking a little bit about, you mentioned Operation Warp Speed, someone asked, how has COVID changed the equation for climate? Does anyone have thoughts about that? And I think what um, you mentioned, Brandon, is one instance of like just seeing vast government action now when it comes to vaccine development and rollout in a way that I had never seen in my lifetime, at least. 
Yeah, I just want to quickly say that I think that COVID, um, one, it showed us what a re vast reduction in human activity can do for the climate. Um, two, it showed us that the federal government has the power to, to do a lot, right? Uh, even under duress, even under a Trump administration, now a Biden administration, that the, that the federal government can show up powerfully and radically. Um, and I think that it showed us that we are all connected in a deep and powerful way and that all of our activities move together in a way that, that was not, I don't know what else could have done it in this particular way. And so I've, I hope that we can continue to build off of those threads and, and actually get to a point where, because I don't think recovery is gonna come from this bill or even the next one, uh, because we're, we're recovering from, from 400 years of, of oppression. Um, but I think it's important that people see that now. They see it in a much different way. And I think elected see it in a way that I have never uh, experienced in, in my lifetime. And so I think the, the challenge is how do we build off of that and how we grow it? But it has definitely changed the game for politics in particular and for humanity humanity, which I think ultimately uh, have a powerful impact on our ability to relate to climate change as a as an existential problem. Yeah, yeah. If I can. No, no, oh, yeah, Lenore. that that's I totally um, agree with john and i'll just add I think another uh, piece that the pandemic has obviously exposed is just how fragile our labor markets are, are sort of different, um, you know, access to jobs is overall, and particularly without any kind of uh, robust care infrastructure, how it all falls apart. <laughs> it's like one, one Jenga piece, one domino, uh, the whole thing uh, falls apart. And I think that um, it's really, it, such, it's not just the pandemic, I feel like the last um, you know, 10 or so years of social movements have really made policymakers uh, change how they view the choices that they have in front of them. So I think there's a lot of narrative right now about how uh, Biden and Harris, how the administration is really uh, taking a new view of the economy. It, and they're able, it's, it's a word that we used in the great financial crisis, there's a crisis-tunity, right? They're responding to the pandemic and that actually makes them uh, able to be bolder in some of the economic choices that they take. But I actually think that's, you know, probably true, but it's actually the last 10 years of uh, social movement organizing in a whole variety uh, of ways that's really changed, I think, the landscape of how we view climate uh, as not something that's over there. <laughs> you know, it's not just kind of there's climate, there's uh, reproductive rights, there's this, there's that. We see the, as John just said, the existential threat. And hopefully, if I can maybe be kind of optimistic, an existential opportunity to not go back, but to go to a different future. Yeah, and I'll say just for my own work, I feel like the pandemic, when I first started talking about the Green New Deal, when we would talk about sort of climate crisis people would sort of glaze over like they couldn't imagine something big enough that it would stop everyday life and so it was sort of like people would go directly to like mad max <laughs> so we're all gonna be in dirt and someone's gonna sell us water and whatnot but i feel like with COVID, people actually i think a lot of people for the first time in their life experienced um a crisis that did in fact curtail daily life and now people have a sense of like what could happen and what this could look like if the climate crisis continues unabated um in a way that they didn't before and i do feel like that has actually um made it easier to talk about climate in some ways than it was before because it's not just an exercise and imagination for people as much as it used to be. Um, so we have another question actually about corporate governance. So someone asked, how can corporate governance policies help mobilize private capital in service of a Green New Deal? So I know I'll start with Lenore since you focus on corporate governance, but I know you probably have some thoughts too, Brandon. So I could talk about corporate governance for a whole other hour, so I won't. Um, but you know, what does corporate governance mean? It just means the way that decisions are made 
inside our large businesses are distinct from how decisions are made over markets and in other places. And I'm, you know, essentially with John that I think that the people whose uh, uh, lives are most directly affected and the people who are creating the value for, in this case, a corporation need to have a role in decision making. We believe in that in our politics. Why don't we believe in that in our economy? So I think there's a whole, um, I, I, I could list and I have written, you know, detailed articles about all the policies that I think we could implement, but I think that uh, sort of fundamentally recognizing that the last 40 years of shareholder primacy uh, really has contributed directly to the climate crisis and the, comp and the acceptance that our sort of our own resources in our very fancy financial intermediation chain, sort of whole financial sector, um, that it is uh, sort of allowed to benefit only a very small group uh, and allowed to benefit um, inside corporations on only a very small group is really a part of how we got here and cannot, we can't simply uh, invest a whole bunch of public or private money in the real innovations uh, that we need to decarbonize, but then expect that everything will just be magically uh, better if we leave our corporate decision making process alone. Yeah, I think to Lenore's point, creating the right incentives with those policy designs and also just more women, more people of color in positions of power <laughs> is going to help that. And I think, you know, we're, we're seeing some hope for that. I, the Biden folks in their personnel decisions are bringing new voices to the table. And I'm, I'm, I'm really encouraged, uh, you know, by what they're doing with that so far. I just want to quickly say that yeah. um, they still need power and we, we really shouldn't be talking about corporate governance and asking corporations to be nicer and invest more. We should be figuring out how to regulate them and how to identify the fact that their profits actually come from government in many ways and how to hold them accountable to, to reinvesting uh, the benefits that they've gotten back into communities uh, as opposed to, to relating to their governance because they're going to govern themselves by their shareholders and by what, what gets them paid. Totally. And I know, Lenore, like you said, you've written a lot about what sort of regulation can be in place and should be in place to change corporate governance. Um, so turning quickly, so someone asked a question about clean energy investments, and they mentioned that clean energy investments like electric vehicles, which are a huge part of the Biden plan, aren't always easily equally distributed. Um, so for instance, they say you can put chargers in an urban neighborhood, but no one uses them because they don't have access to the cars. Um, and there, I mean, that is true. Their electric vehicles have not all, have not come down the cost curve in the way that I think a lot of people need them to, to have easy access to them. So what policies uh, or in what ways can we make clean energy tech investments beneficial to all communities without investments going into the communities where the community doesn't actually benefit? I'm just going to jump in here and say this is not about clean energy investments. This is about racial capitalism. They're still redlining all of the prohibitive ways that black and brown people are denied access. And just because there's some really cool black people in like Chevy's commercials does not mean that that banks and the financiers that they're working with are not still redlining. So it's not just about clean energy. It's about the fact that we have to hold finance, insurance and real estate accountable for creating racial capitalism, particularly a housing and a, 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 just a physical relationship that means that it's not only more expensive to live in poor communities, but that there's such a higher standard. Uh, because if we didn't have credit, it'd be a whole lot easier to, to, to do this. So I just want to name that this is a, a, a problem that we are not post redlining, we are not post racial capitalism. And we have to deal with that before we can really fully deal with climate change and for these kind of plans to work out. I'll just add that the good news is the costs are coming down dramatically on electric vehicles. There is a ton of investment. Uh, the private sector is moving there on its own because of the cost of the battery is getting so so much cheaper, and that's the main cost uh, of the EV. But I think that there are policies that we can design to accelerate this and make it, you know, equity-based. You know, there is talk of like a cash for clunkers where you can swap out uh, your 
traditional vehicle, uh, you know, for a, an, an electric vehicle. And we can start, uh, you know, with, you know, BIPOC communities on that. And there's ways, you know, B Biden is talking about this um, uh, climate and economic justice screening tool, uh, which could be used to, you know, prioritize which neighborhoods could you start first with programs like that so that we can help, you know, create the right uh, policy incentives and, and, and the right investments uh, to swap those out and, and get, you know, electric vehicles more equitably distributed. Totally. And all I'll add is that I don't know, I'm sure that this really truly won't help much because they are incredibly rich and also uh, tend to be um, very sort of neoliberal in their views of the economy. But I will say Tesla is the new hot car in a lot of hip hop songs. Uh, my bestie pulled up in a Tessie, you know, so I feel like that is, <laughs> I haven't heard of many people talk about Tesla's before. So I'll just put that out. Thanks to Saweetie for that. <laughs> um, and so the last thing that someone asked is actually what is the number one thing the Biden administration can do to move forward climate forward policy? Um, so someone asked if I could answer this. Um, so I will say, I mean, a lot of what they're doing right now, which is actually putting climate at the center of economic recovery um, and an economic recovery plan. And I say that because I think we've seen in the past, say, just looking at the CARES Act, when you don't do that, um, just like Lenore mentioned that if you don't deliberately think about equity and design policy so that the outcomes are more likely to be equitable, um, then, then it's just not going to happen. And I think it's very similar with climate. So we saw with the CARES Act, there was a lot of fighting, right, to say that none of the CARES Act should be conditioned on climate, on climate outcomes. And you ended up with a lot of money going to the fossil fuel industry, um, billions of dollars going to the fossil fuel industry and nowhere near as much money going to clean energy and solar. And so you saw Clean energy is one of the biggest job creators, has been projected to be one of the biggest job creators, and you saw them just lose hundreds of thousands of jobs. Um, and so I think actually including climate continually in the plan for economic recovery um, and in the ways that we think about economic policy is incredibly crucial. Um, so are there any last pressing thoughts from our panel? Otherwise we'll move to closing. No? All no, right. Um, so just wanted to thank all the speakers for being here. It was really a delight. You are some of my favorite people. So it was really awesome to nerd out for an hour. Um, and like we said a lot today, that there's a lot to commend in the American Jobs Plan, particularly in the structure. Um, it's a proposal that's honestly signals both um, some new approaches to economic policymaking to climate policy, and in some ways, uh, what could be a new era uh, in policymaking where we're focusing on visible direct benefits, where we're trying to think about deployment of clean energy and really put equity front and center. But like we said, there are still a lot of questions. And in particular, I wanna raise what John said, which is that racial capitalism continues to be at the center of our economy and will continue to be a problem problem um, that we have to tackle in all of our designs. And also, we still have a lot to go in terms of thinking about the infrastructure and the support that is needed so that communities can be real partners um, instead of just being thought of as recipients. Um, and then the last thing that we want to talk about is that the scale also still needs to be larger. In the work that Roosevelt has done, we've seen that to fully decarbonize our economy, it will take about 3 to 5% of GDP every year for 10 years. And so that's about 10 trillion over 10 years. And so we have a lot of movement to do both on scale and the ways that we think about paying for that um, and the role of debt financing and, and why that 
it's particularly important to embrace right now. Um, but still achieving a climate forward economy um, will of course require deeper healing than the American jobs plan, but it's still an important first step and an overdue down payment. And with folks like this, we'll keep working on it, we'll keep organizing around it and we'll keep pushing for it to be better. So thank you all so much for being here. It was a real honor. Uh, and I hope you all have a great rest of the day, a great rest of the week uh, and continue to fight for a more just and equitable and green economy. Goodbye everyone. <laughs> <laughs>